I would like to bring Jeff Wood up to introduce our speaker for the evening. He is a regular contributor to several weekly and monthly newspapers. He hosts the daily newscast FPP Radio News, the podcast Peace, Love, Liberty Radio, the weekly news podcast FPP Freedom Minute, and is a regular co-host on Free Talk Live. Daryl is also the current vice chair of the New Hampshire Libertarian Party, and he is the owner and managing editor of Free Press Publications. Mr. Perry. Good evening. Uh, please forgive the ill-fitting jacket. I've recently lost about 40 pounds in the last two months. So, I can lose weight than anybody can. I'm doing like some sort of weird low-carb, low-fat sort of pescatarian thing. I don't really know. Uh, but like, I get to eat crab legs, and that's great. Uh, so the theme of this convention is growing liberty. And I, I'm a little surprised that nobody's really talked about how to grow liberty. People have talked about you know, various things that the party can do to try to grow the party, but is the Libertarian Party the same as liberty? And I would say no. The Libertarian Party certainly helps to grow liberty, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the things that you can do to grow liberty in or outside of the Libertarian Party. Uh, the first thing that you have to do, and there are very few things that I tell libertarians and anarchists that they have to do, but the one thing that you have to do is stand on your principles. And I'm not going to say stand on libertarian principles or stand on anarchist principles, because everybody has a different interpretation of what that means. And uh, let me just pause for a second and say that instead of saying libertarians and anarchists or you know, including voluntarists, I'll just use the term libertarian. And when I use the term, I like to include everybody in what I call the libertarian circle. So that would be libertarians, anarchists, agorists, voluntarists, uh, you know, any other number of things, you know, anarcho, whatevers. You know, anybody that believes in less government, more personal freedom, and not using force upon other people. That is what I define a libertarian to be. And other people can add certain things to it. They can subtract a little bit from that. But what it boils down to, if you're a libertarian, you agree that forcing people to do things is wrong. Now, there are, you know, again, various uh, interpretations of what that means, like, you know, can we have a minimal state? Do we need to completely abolish? And I, I would lean towards abolishing all coercive governments. And I'll talk about what I mean on that a little bit later. Uh, but, you know, stand on your principles. And I, I'm not going to say that, you know, you're not necessarily as libertarian if your principle you know, very slightly from mine or slightly from somebody else's, as long as you agree on not using force. And something else that you at least should agree on is that all human beings are equal. And what does that mean? And then that's been, you know, the subject of many books and podcasts and essays and everything else. When I say all humans are equal, I mean that every human being Anywhere on Earth, anywhere in outer space, you know, there's humans right now on the international space stations. There might be one going to Mars sometime soon. That person has as many rights as you do. You have as many rights as Barack Obama. Now, of course, Barack Obama gets, you know, extra uh, leeway with the exercise of his rights. But that does not mean that Barack Obama has more rights than you. It doesn't even mean that somebody living in North Korea has less rights than you. You still have the same rights. It's whether or not you're allowed to exercise those rights without repercussion. And one thing that I like to point out is that you have the same rights, again, as everybody else. Every group of individuals 
has the same rights as any individual in the group. And a lot of times you hear people talk about group rights, uh, gay rights, or you know, trans rights. But people have rights that groups do not. There are some conservatives that will call themselves libertarians that say states have rights. No, no they don't. People have rights. People have the right to form groups. They have a right to form governments if they so choose. And we're told that governments exist with the consent of the governed. And well, we know that to be a big, huge lie because I don't know of anyone. Actually, raise your hand if you consent to everything that has been done by the US government in the last week. I didn't think so. OK, in the last five minutes, can, can anybody think of anything in the last five minutes that the US government has done that they personally consent to? OK, nobody in here consents to what the US federal government is doing. But how do you withdraw that consent? And this is actually something I've looked into about you know, like, how do I say that I'm no longer a US citizen? Because that, that was something that I was told, like, you were born here, you're a US citizen. Well, I don't really want that. I, I don't want to be a citizen of anywhere. And the State Department actually has procedures on renouncing your US citizenship. And it actually requires you to leave the jurisdiction of the United States of America, go to a US embassy, fill out a bunch of paperwork, give them a bunch of money, and then swear that you will never return to the United States of America. And that basically means that you then become subject to another country because every government claims jurisdiction over everybody in their physical presence. So the people that love to tell libertarians, if you don't like it, leave. Well, where am I going to go where somebody isn't trying to force me to do something? Some government somewhere is going to try to force me to pay a tax, register a vehicle, get a piece of paper or plastic saying who I am, when I was born, and everything else. So there really is no way to remove your consent that you never actually gave. And I, I love to point out that that's no different than signing a contract under duress. And a lot of people, the you know, analogy gets lost on them, and they're like, but you didn't sign anything. Well, true, but I, I'm supposedly you know, being governed with consent, but I don't consent. How do I withdraw the consent? Well, you can't. OK, if someone forces me to sign a contract under common law and under an actual statutory law, that contract is null and void, as if it never happened. But yet, we can't really do that now. I, I would love to get to the point, some point in the future, to where you could not only secede individually, but you know, groups of people could secede from the US government, from the state of Michigan, from Oakland County, whatever county it is that you live in, and people would be allowed to decide if and or how they are governed. And some people might say, but there's, you know, that, that's never happened before. And that's actually a historically inaccurate statement to say that there have never been stateless societies in the world before. Ireland, for I've heard between one to 2,000 years, was stateless. There were clans that had you know, certain territories, but there was no actual government as we think of government because you can have people from one clan living next door to another clan that live next door to a third clan, and none of those three people would be under the same sort of jurisdiction, jurisprudence. In Medina, in what is now Saudi Arabia, during the life of Muhammad, there were Jews, Christians, pagans, and Muslims all living in the same city living, again, next door to one another, and they were all under different jurisprudence. And there have been some examples limited in the US where things like that have happened, where different fraternal organizations would provide medical care, certain level of security, and of course that sort of went away in the 1930s when the US government was like, all right, so we're taking over all of this now. So statelessness, 
is actually something that there is historical precedent for, and I would love to get to that point in the future. And I, I know there are some libertarians that will say, well, you know, like stateless communism could never work. Well, maybe it wouldn't, but you know, let the communists try to have their stateless society as long as they're not forcing me to fund their communism. You know, and you know, any other sort of form of statelessness. I know some people, raise your hand if you've ever heard of the Venus Project. Okay, those people, for, forgive me for saying, they're crazy. Uh, basically, they want uh, communism that's run by a giant supercomputer. And they claim that it's voluntary, but if you live in the area, you have to you know, use whatever supercomputer gives you. So they claim it's voluntary, but then they want to force you to comply. So that's not actually voluntary. But if they could do that voluntarily without forcing people, let them go have their communist computer. Uh, moving on, other things that people can do to spread liberty, free speech. Now, that's a big one that we've heard about a lot recently. There was the lady down in Texas that had the Draw Muhammad Day. And we all know how that turned out. Uh, apparently several people shot, killed. And I, I've heard some libertarians defending her. And to them, I say, just because you can say something doesn't mean you should say something. Uh, the Charlie Hebdo thing made headlines a couple of months ago. There was the French, they, they claimed to be a satire magazine where they had images of Muhammad on a cover, but they also had horrible articles advocating for Muslims to be killed and the French military to invade Muslim countries. So Charlie Hebdo and their editors, they were not just innocent people expressing freedom of speech by, oh, here's this cartoon that people don't want to see. They were saying, here's a cartoon people don't want, don't want to see, and the people that don't want you to see this should all die. Do, do they have the free speech rights to say that? And I, I would say that that borders whether or not they actually do have the right to say that, because it borders whether or not they are advocating for the use of force, whether they are advocating aggression. And that you know, it becomes a touchy subject because libertarians, again, they like to argue the nuances of the non-aggression principle. Uh, well, the non-aggression principle says that you can't commit force or fraud. Does that mean that you can run an extortion website? And there are some libertarians that say that running an extortion website is not committing force or fraud because you're providing a service. And other libertarians say that running an extortion website actually is committing force or fraud. And again, you know, we, we can have this debate for hours on end, and nobody would ever have their mind changed. But I, I forget who said it. I, I want to say Gandhi, but I'm probably totally inaccurate here, where there's anyway a famous quote that says, before you say something, ask yourself, is it true? Is it helpful? And that, that's really what you should do when you're exercising free speech, is you should ask yourself, is it true, is it helpful? And when the question of is it helpful, it doesn't mean just will it help the person that I am saying this to, will it help me, will it help the ideas of liberty? And I, I realize that I'm sort of collectivizing liberty as a group of people, but you really should think of more than just yourself when you're doing outreach. Because there, there are certain people that have websites that get a lot of hits, that they just say the most outrageous inflammatory thing they can think of because they know that somebody's going to go to their website and say, can you believe what this person wrote on their website? That was the most outrageous inflammatory thing I've ever heard. And so people go to the website and they get ad revenue because people are going to their website. But it does nothing to actually spread the ideas of liberty. It does a lot to you know, spread their bank account a little thicker, but it doesn't actually spread the ideas of liberty. And that's what we're talking about, is how to grow liberty. And but let's talk about some of the actual issues that libertarians should be taking positions on, and not just 
when you're talking to your friends, but when you're running for office and when you're talking to the media or when you're being invited to speak to various political groups or you know, even candidate debates. How many people have run for office and been invited to candidate debates or forums? Okay, good many. I know in a lot of places they will invite anybody that's on the ballot. Other places they only invite the Republicans and Democrats and you know, oh, Libertarian, yeah, they don't have a chance. We're not inviting them because we, we did a poll and we didn't ask it if anybody actually wanted to vote for the Libertarian, but the Libertarian didn't meet the vote threshold that we set up to actually be invited to the debate, so he's not coming. So when you go to these debates and you advocate your principles, then one of the things you should be doing is you should not be advocating for higher taxation. The 2012 LP presidential candidate actually was doing this. He was advocating for higher taxation. You might not think that he was. He might even argue that he was not. But when you advocate instituting a national sales tax, that's exactly what you're doing, is you're advocating for new taxation, especially on some of the handful of states where they have no sales tax. I currently live in New Hampshire, where if I don't buy prepared meals or stay in a hotel, I don't pay sales tax. So whenever I go to the grocery store, no sales tax. Unless, of course, I'm going to the wing bar, in which it's you know, the prepared mill. Uh, you guys last week voted down the increase of a sales tax that I've heard some people say would have reduced some of the taxes on fuel, and it may have also reduced some other things, and there were a bunch of things added to it, and I've heard that there was actually a member of this party that was advocating for increasing that tax because he felt that it would have done some sort of overall benefit. But when you increase taxes, you're saying that more theft is good because that's what taxation is. Taxation is theft. Let's go back to the everybody has the same rights point that I made earlier. I can't steal Mary's watch. Me and Jeff can't get together and say, well, we voted, we're taking Mary's watch. That is theft. If everybody in the room voted, I still would not have the authority to steal Mary's watch. But somehow, if everybody in the room calls themselves the government of the state of Michigan, then all of a sudden they can steal Mary's watch? No, it is still theft. And let, let me just sort of make a point about one of the platform proposals earlier. And I'm glad that this actually wound up getting shot down. And Scotty, with all due respect, the contract insurance thing, I don't see that as a user fee because an actual user fee is something that is completely voluntary. If you're signing a contract and pretty much every contract you sign, unless it's a private party to private party contract, is going to say that this contract is enforced by the laws of the state of fill in the blank, and that gets filed somewhere with the state of fill in the blank, then that's not voluntary. Voluntary is when me and someone else writes a contract and says, if there's a dispute, we will find a mutual arbiter. That is voluntary. And then whoever the mutual arbiter is would get paid a fee only if we had a dispute. We would not just go randomly pay arbiters, oh, well, we have a contract and you might possibly be the arbiter at some point someday, here's money. So well, what I would love to see, and I've written about this before, is voluntary taxation. And I do not consider user fees, and what most people think of as user fees is driver's license, driver's license, renewal, vehicle registration, vehicle registration, renewal, uh, filing a title change on property, and a couple of other things. But again, because there's no competition between who you get to file those documents with, it's not an actual voluntary user fee. It's a coerced user fee. So how do we fund government without coerced user fees and without theft? Well, you have people donate money. It's the same way private charities operate. There are food banks. 
that you can donate money to if you like the service that they provide. If you like art, you go to the Actors Guild, whatever. So people pay for the services that they like. I like art, so when I get the chance, I go to an art museum, I'll make a donation, I'll buy something out of the gift shop. That's a user fee. Even though, yes, I know that most art museums wind up getting government subsidies, but that's you know, more because of government regulations that basically allow them to get these subsidies to begin with. But those subsidies make up such a small percentage of their total budget that if everybody that went to the art museums would donate one extra dollar, they could do away with the government subsidies. And how many people remember the uh, Mitt Romney wants to kill Big Bird thing from a couple years ago? Yeah. PBS, gets, I think it's like 13% of their budget comes from taxpayer funding. I would donate, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, and it's on camera this time. Uh, it's been audio recorded in the past, but I'll say it again. If the U.S. federal government stopped funding PBS, I would give them $20 a month. And I know other people that would probably do the same. They can make up that money without the government force if the government just said, okay, we're not funding this anymore. Now, why would I donate to PBS? I don't have a small child that lives with me, but when I was a kid, I used to love watching Reading Rainbow. I, until I was like 12, I had no clue that, that LeVar Burton was an actor on Star Trek. I just thought he was some guy that had a show on PBS and he liked books. Like, you know, Mr. Rogers wasn't an actor. He was a guy that had a show on PBS and he loved kids. And he changed his shoes and wore a sweater vest. And just sort of a quick aside, I used to live in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, the Trove, Pennsylvania. Mr. Rogers and Arnold Palmer are from the same town. I used to live there, and uh, I'll leave it at that. But uh, So taxation, whenever you run as a candidate, you should always advocate for decreasing taxes and increasing freedom. And I, I remember hearing Ron Paul, and I, I'm going to name drop that real quick, but I, I remember hearing Ron Paul speak one time about, I don't know how freedom got separated into economic and personal. Freedom is freedom. But most people, they think of economic freedom, personal freedom. So I, I'm just going to transition real quick to personal freedom. And then I will, you know, again, explain some more ways that people can expand freedom, things that you can do, even if you don't want to run for office, things that you can do to expand freedom. So on personal freedom, one of the biggest things on personal freedom is the drug war. To where, you know, what is the last figure I saw, 25 billion a year is what the federal government spends every year on the drug war. Uh, the various states spend on average like 15 to 20 million a year on the drug war. That's throwing people in jail for having small amounts of drugs. And there, there are some people that call themselves libertarians that say, well, we can end the drug war if we tax and regulate cannabis. And I, I know a lot of people look at Colorado and Washington as examples of, well, look how well it turned out for them. They had the tax or uh, regulate cannabis like wide initiative, and it passed, and they made all this money. Well, I, I think that we should regulate everything like tomatoes. And I will explain why tomatoes. Because I, I see a very confused look on somebody in the front row. Uh, the reason I chose tomatoes is because I don't know of any state that regulates the number of tomatoes that you can purchase when you go to the grocery store or the farmer's market. I don't know of any state that regulates the number of tomato plants you can grow at your house. I don't know of any state that regulates how much ketchup you can have. I don't know of any state that regulates anything to do with tomatoes specifically. Now, there are regulations on you know, selling something without a business license. But in New Hampshire, and I've actually looked specifically at the New Hampshire RSAs because, again, that's where I'm currently living, the word tomato is not in the statutes. Oh, RSA, for those of you that look confused, is revised statutes annotated. 
That, that's what they call their section of laws. Most play, you know, statutes or uh, you know, code of law, or whatever. So nowhere in the statutes in New Hampshire is the word tomato anywhere. So if we made cannabis as legal as tomatoes, it would not be anywhere in the statute. And I'm not talking just about cannabis. Cannabis obviously is the biggest one, the most visible, the one that is the most popular in opinion polls. I've seen surveys that said uh, somewhere as high as like 60% of Americans think that cannabis should either be uh, decriminalized or taxed and regulated. So overwhelmingly popular. But when you talk about crystal meth, heroin, I, I think their approval rating is actually lower than that of Congress, and that's kind of hard to do, because the approval rating of Congress is lower than that of toe fungus. Uh, I, I did see a survey that showed that Darth Vader actually has a higher approval rating than the major party presidential candidates for 2016. So you know, when you think about just how unpopular Republicans and Democrats are and how unpopular their policies are, crystal meth and heroin are less popular than that. But I think that, again, because I think that all people are equal and that people are smart enough to know what to put in their body. And yes, there are some people that get addicted to heroin. But about 110 years ago, you could purchase heroin out of this book called the Sears Robot Catalog. Not only could you purchase heroin, but you could also purchase morphine, you could purchase your needles, you could purchase the syringe itself and cannabis from the Sears Robot Catalog because there were no federal regulations at all on any substance. And then there was the Food and Drug Administration Act that started classifying things and saying, okay, well, you can have these, if you have a note from a doctor, and then they started going from there. And I am not a constitutionalist by any means, but I do love the hypocrisy of someone who does not believe that the United States government should exist at all, signing the US Constitution. So when alcohol was prohibited at the federal level, it required this thing called a constitutional amendment. And then when alcohol was deemed to be safe and legal again, it again required a constitutional amendment. But yet, crystal meth, heroin, cocaine, cannabis, and a list of things that I could probably never pronounce in 27 years are all illegal without a constitutional amendment because Nixon said, all right, uh, here's all this stuff that's bad, and states, you have to adopt these laws, otherwise we won't give you money. And I, I find it rather humorous that still 40 years, you know, 40 some odd years after the Controlled Substances Act was instituted, that cannabis, which is legal in, what is it, 23 states plus DC for medicinal purposes, is still classified as having no medicinal value at all. Psilocybin is actually listed as a safer drug than cannabis because there are medicinal uses for psilocybin. Uh, PTSD and chronic headache being two of the things that I can think of off the top of my head. And I, I how, how many people listen to Free Talk Live, by the way? Okay, so a few of you. Uh, the, those of you who listen, you've probably heard me talk about the headache that I've had for about three and a half years because I've had about 13 concussions. And one of the concussions that I had did something in the brain and I've had a headache ever since. There are certain ways that I can treat the headache. Uh, one of them is legal with a prescription and rather costly and it involves me taking a barbiturate that is highly addictive because barbiturates are highly addictive. It also requires me to take another pill to counteract the effects of the barbiturates. The other thing that I can do to relieve the headache that I have tried is cannabis tinctures. Uh, something that I have heard but I have never tried is taking psilocybin. Apparently people with chronic headaches show improvements when they take psilocybin. So psilocybin, the federal government actually recognizes the medicinal benefit of psilocybin but not that of cannabis. 
So I, I just think that that is utterly ridiculous. And hopefully, you know, at some point within my lifetime, the Controlled Substances Act ceases to exist so that I can get the treatment that I need without threat of going to jail. Even though, again, I live in New Hampshire. New Hampshire passed a therapeutic cannabis law a couple of years ago. And the Marijuana Policy Project is estimating that it's going to be at least another year and a half before any patient in New Hampshire is allowed to purchase cannabis legally. Uh, unfortunately, when medicinal cannabis goes into effect where people can purchase it legally, I still will not be allowed to do so because I don't claim residency in New Hampshire. I don't want to claim residency anywhere, but I've got this little piece of plastic that expires when I'm 65 from Arizona that says that I can drive vehicles, so I plan on keeping that. And New Hampshire actually charged me with the, the offense of being a resident without fulfilling the obligations of residency, which means that I don't have a piece of plastic from the state of New Hampshire saying that I know how to operate a vehicle. And there are reasons that I don't have that, mainly because I want to keep the one that expires when I'm 65, and also because I have this thing in South Carolina that I like to refer to as my no trespass order to the entire state of South Carolina. Uh, there, there was a speeding ticket, supposedly running a stop sign and not wearing a seatbelt. Uh, and the cop actually gave me the wrong day for court. I missed the day for court, which means that I can no longer request a jury trial. So now I have this warrant that I refuse to pay. So at some point, I know I'm going to wind up getting arrested. And just for the record, how many presidential candidates have you ever heard say that uh, they know that at some point they'll get arrested and they don't care? Okay, so I'm the first. Yes. So I, I know at some point, you know, this is going to come back and you know, bite me, but I, I really don't care. Like, I'm tired of playing by their rules on certain things. You know, yeah, obviously every now and then I'll play by the rules to, you know, wind up not getting arrested every time I drive down the street or every time I walk down the sidewalk. So, you know, you, you do have to play by the rules a little bit. But as far as, you know, paying this fine in South Carolina, not going to do it. As far as getting the piece of plastic from the state of New Hampshire, not going to do it. Uh, New Hampshire, in addition to charging me with being a resident, they also charged me with uh, operating an unregistered vehicle, took it to trial, was found guilty, asked the judge for community service, he denied the community service, I refused to pay the fine, and so I spent three days in jail last year. Uh, the Two of those three days were the only two days that I took off last year. Uh, I partially worked for myself, and one of the things that Jeff mentioned is the daily newscast. I've done a seven-day newscast for about 14 months now, absent three days. Two of those I was in jail. So like I, I am not easy on myself. Like I, I'm the hardest boss I've ever had. And one other thing that I refuse to comply with is Federal Election Commission requirements. I actually sent the FEC a letter two years ago saying I intend this to be the first, last, and only communication I have with you. I will not be filing your Form 2. I will not be filing any campaign finance updates. And I will not be accepting US dollars for my campaign. I will only accept Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies, and precious metals. And there are some people that have that look that you have right there, like, are you crazy? <laughs> and maybe, maybe I am. But for those of you that don't know what Bitcoin is, Bitcoin is a money that is not regulated by the US government. Uh, the New York Department of Financial Services attempted to not only regulate Bitcoin, but every person that does or that uses Bitcoin for their business if one of their customers lives in New York. So basically it would have put New York regulations on every Bitcoin business in the world that has done business at some point with someone in New York State. Luckily that was defeated. And I, I'm going to, you know, I, I promise I'm going to make my way to the next thing of what you can do to grow liberty, but this is my segue. So in, in response to the New York Department of Financial Services proposed regulation to regulate basically everybody that has ever used Bitcoin that 
like looked at a sign that said New York that one time. I wrote up a proposal to basically say that government agencies cannot regulate Bitcoin. And I thought that someone in the New Hampshire State House had introduced my bill, but he modified it slightly. So he didn't actually introduce my bill verbatim, but he introduced something extremely close to my bill. And that's something that you can do. How many people like reading legislative statutes and bills? OK, there's one of you. OK, so I'm talking to you for about the next 15 minutes. Um, so something that I do, and I've told the New Hampshire State House Election Law Committee that I do this, and half of them gave the same response that you guys just did. I read statutes and write legislative proposals for fun. So uh, something that you can do, and I, I realize that this might not seem like it grows liberty, but it does. If you can go to the committees, find out when their hearings are. I have been in the state of Michigan now for about uh, 30 hours, and I looked on the website, found when the legislative hearings are. They don't have any next week, but in two weeks they've got some. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, it's a different, you know, different committees meet those days. So each committee meets one day a week for, I looked about like seven to eight months out of the year. So what I have done is I have adopted the election law committee of the New Hampshire State House. There has been two executive sessions that I missed and the hearing on two bills. I have a better attendance rating as a self-appointed shadow legislator than half of the people that are on the election law committee that are getting paid $100 a year plus mileage to go to Concord, New Hampshire. And I'm doing this for free. So if people live close to Lansing and they have you know, one day a week that they can spare, it, it might not even be the entire day. Sometimes it's only half a day. But find a committee that hears bills that you're interested in. Read the bills that they're going to hear and go testify. And again, testify based on what your principles are. Not what I think libertarian principles are, because there, there have been times where I've disagreed with libertarians in the audience. Then there was a bill, uh, one that comes to mind, where I was actually cited in, I believe it was Cointelegraph, as being the opposition, where I was the only person to testify against the bill. There were about 20 people that spoke in favor. Some of the people were like bank regulators that spoke in favor of this bill that would have required the state treasurer of the state of New Hampshire to uh, find a third party payment processor to accept Bitcoin on behalf of the state and then transfer it to dollars. And I spoke against it because I said, wait a second, like this is going to create a monopoly. You're going to find a single payment processor. You're not going to be allowed to you know, find three, four, five, as many payment processors as you want. Then there's a company that I do business with called GIFT. It's spelled G-Y-F-T. And they allow you to purchase gift cards to like Target and Home Depot. And you can buy these with Bitcoin. And they have multiple options of who you can check out with with Bitcoin. You can check out with BitPay, you can check out with Coinbase. I like choices. Like that, that's one of the reasons I support a free market is I like choices. And so they, they wanted to do this thing to limit it to you have one choice if you want to pay with Bitcoin. And the sponsor of the bill has actually pulled me aside in the hallway of the state house at various times to ask my opinion on ways that he can modify the bill to make it better and get my support. Now, that would not have happened if I never went to testify. That would not have happened if he has not seen me multiple times. And again, I go up at least once a week. Now, obviously, right now, they're in the phase of like winding down a hearing, so I've not been in about two weeks. But legislators will pull me aside to ask my opinion on bills. I'm not a paid lobbyist, but basically they look at me as a lobbyist slash authority on certain things. And there, there was one of the reps on the election law committee that asked my opinion about a bill that was not before his committee, but that he thought might somehow affect election laws and be the recipient of a lawsuit. And then there were, I forget who was speaking earlier, uh, Reverend Carrick was speaking earlier and said, don't forget that lawsuits are always an option for advancing liberty. 
And there have been you know, many lawsuits that wind up advancing liberty, a lot of lawsuits that wind up not really advancing liberty so much. But you know, it's always the option, especially when governments are doing things to interfere with rights. And there was a lawsuit I, I, to where there, there's some people in Guam that want to have a plebiscite about the future of Guam. Basically, self-determination. And that's something that I am big on, is self-determination. They want to have this plebiscite. And what they're saying is that you can only vote in the plebiscite if you are a direct descendant of someone who was living in Guam in 1898 when the US government you know, basically became the owner of Guam. There's somebody that is not a descendant of the people that were living in Guam in 1898, filed a lawsuit and said, well, I live here, I've lived here for a while, I should be able to vote. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the lawsuit can go forward. The Guam Election Commission was saying this lawsuit should not go forward. Ninth Circuit Court said the lawsuit gets to go forward because even though, uh, I, I, I know I'm going to butcher what this said, I've only read it about three times. Uh, even a right is denied even if the remedy is not, or no, unequal treatment is still unequal even if the remedy is not, has no real consequence. So basically, they, they don't know yet if this election is going to happen. So the Guam Election Commission is saying, this guy has no standing. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said, yeah, he does have standing. Like, even, we don't know if the election's going to go forward. We don't know if he's actually going to get the remedy he wants, but he's still being treated unequally. And there are so many things that I can think of that that applies to. And one of them is third parties. I, I know, luckily, you guys here in Michigan, you have this wonderful thing that I wish we had in New Hampshire called ballot access to where you collect a number of signatures, you're on the ballot, and as long as you get you know, some minuscule amount of votes every year, then your party remains on the ballot. In New Hampshire, the Libertarians have to jump through hoops and hurdles every two years, and there's a lawsuit right now that is being brought forth by the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union, which is the New Hampshire affiliate of the ACLU. It's being brought forth officially by the Libertarian Party, but it's only being brought forth because I contacted the lawyer in the ACLU and said, Gilles, will you file this lawsuit? The lawsuit is challenging a law that was passed last year that says that a political party cannot collect petitions except in the year of the election. And there have been court cases in both Rhode Island, which is in the same First Circuit, and also in Arkansas, striking down prohibitions on political activity in the year before the election. The New Hampshire Secretary of State is coming up with all of these strange arguments for why the law is good and necessary and needed. None of those he gave to the election law committee. He just said, this is a housekeeping proposal. You need to pass it. And of course they did. So now he is saying that, uh, well, the political candidates can campaign while they're petitioning. How many people have done petitioning for whether it be a candidate or a ballot initiative or what have you? When you are doing that, you're focused on doing one thing, collecting petitions. You're not there focusing on convincing people to vote for whatever it is that you're advocating. Because once you start having that five, 10, 15 minute conversation with somebody, all of a sudden they say, I don't want to sign your thing anymore. Scratch my name off of your petition. You then lose how many people that walk down the sidewalk while you were having that conversation. So you're losing out on collecting petitions. And luckily the ACLU has pointed this out that no, like petitioning and campaigning are two separate things. They're supposed to be two separate distinct things. The major party candidates are going to have their first presidential debate in about three months, I believe. Uh, the Republicans are having one in October, or uh, August. They're, they're having one in August, which is like three months away. And right now, in some states, it is illegal to collect a petition for a Libertarian Party candidate to get on the ballot. So how is that fair? Again, unequal treatment is unequal even if the remedy has no real consequence. 
So just with the, okay, we put the libertarian on the ballot, it's not really going to change in a lot of cases, it's not going to change the outcome of the election, so it can be argued it has no real consequence, but it's still unequal treatment. Then there was this uh, court case from uh, 1954, I think it was, that said separate is not equal, but yet somehow we think that separate is equal when it applies to political candidates. Oh, well, you know, you, you have to show that you have some level of support to run as a candidate. Well, no, no you don't. There are Republicans and Democrats that have some of the most despicable views that I have ever seen that got elected only because they were unopposed. Nobody ran against them in the primary, nobody ran against them in the general election. They had to get zero support. They only had to vote for themselves to get elected. But yet, because I want to have an L or an I next to my name, then I have to jump through this massive hurdle that sometimes is like you know 15 times higher than the little speed bump that the Republicans or the Democrats have to sort of step over. Sometimes they don't even have to step, they just sort of like lay there and roll over. But again, uh, I, I saw a statistic 60% of the Alabama legislature got elected without opposition. In New Hampshire, it was about 20. Uh, I looked at Michigan, but I don't recall it off the top of my head, but it was somewhere around, I believe, 25 or 30%. They got elected without opposition, meaning that no one ran against them, not even a libertarian. And I, I realized that, you know, in a state where you do have ballot access, it's hard finding people that are willing and able to run a campaign. Obviously, you don't have the burden of collecting petitions to get on the ballot, but you still have to put forth some kind of effort to run a decent campaign. I've run paper candidacies before, and I've run what I would consider you know, real legitimate candidacies before. The paper campaigns, all you have to do is file saying, I want to run. If you get a candidate survey from a newspaper, fill it out, mail it back, post you what? So you spend 47 cents plus whatever the envelope cost, unless they give you the envelope and the stamp, and sometimes they're nice and they do that. And when you do that, you get to advocate your principles. And what I encourage people to do when they run for office is don't run, especially if it's an office that you are fairly certain you're not going to win, don't run on an incrementalist position. And what I mean by that is the, let's take this one baby step. Even though I wanna go 27 miles down the road, I'm running on let's take a baby step. Because that gives you absolutely no leeway to compromise. And again, if you go and you testify to legislators and you're testifying from the, you should not be regulating this at all point of view, and then they say, well, how can we make this better? What about if we, and then they take about a step and a half towards where you're standing? Then you've actually made a net gain as opposed to if you said, oh yeah, let's tax and regulate this, make tax 25%, uh, you can have up to a quarter ounce of cannabis and this, that, the other thing, and you're advocating that incrementalist position. Then you, you've actually taken a step backwards if they, if you were saying you shouldn't regulate it at all, and they come back and say, well, what about if we allow you to have an ounce before we give you a ticket? Well, what if, and they, they start coming towards you a little bit. And that, that's a little bit about what uh, Michael Pickens was talking about earlier, about do you want to be the lion or the porcupine? Do you want to be in the corner trying to fend them off, or do you want to have them in the corner trying to fend you off? And I, when I say that, I, I'm not talking about in you know, like the actual sense of you have a legislator up against the wall saying, you're gonna do this. But from that principle, this is what we want. Now they, okay, well, to get your support, could we do this? And they start backing away from where they were and coming around towards your position. And I, I heard some people last night talking about they want to follow what the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance does. Uh, real quick, how many people have heard of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance? Okay. 
So for those of you who don't know about the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, it's this amazing multi-partisan organization. They call themselves nonpartisan. I'm going to call it what it really is. They're a multi-partisan organization. There are Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, and undeclares that are all involved with the NHLA. And they have volunteers that try to read every piece of legislation that is to go before the New Hampshire legislature. And they've got some sort of calculation spreadsheet thing that based on answers to questions, scores the bills from a plus 37.5 to a negative 37.5. So you answer questions such as, will this bill advance liberty? Is this bill written honestly and clearly? And you can answer yes to that question even if it's the worst bill ever. The bill could say the Libertarian Party of Michigan is hereby prohibited. Every member of the Libertarian Party of Michigan goes to jail, goes directly to jail, and does not collect $200. That would be a clearly written bill. It would be a horrible bill, but it would be clearly written. There could be a bill, and there have been bills that say the minimum wage shall be $16 or the rate set by the federal government. Well, that's very dubious and vague because it doesn't say whichever is higher, whichever is lower, the employer gets to choose. So if I were you know, enforcing that, I'd say, well, all right, well, you're using the federal minimum, so technically you're in compliance with this law. Even though the intent is we want it to be 16, well, you're still in compliance because you're one or the other, that's a poorly written bill, it's a bad bill, and obviously they would interpret it to be even worse than what my the good interpretation was. And there, there are other things, and the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance sends out emails to people saying, these bills are having hearings. And they put out a uh, suggestion for the legislators. So they put out what they call the gold standard. And I've actually heard some people that aren't fans of liberty refer to that as the libertarian plan book. And you know whatever you want to call it, you're giving legislators advice, this is the liberty position. There are state reps who do everything they can to get an A or an A-plus rating from the NHLA. There are other state reps who will do everything they can to get a D, an F, or a constitutional threat rating from the NHLA so that they can say, I'm the complete opposite of those people that like liberty. And Sadly, some of those people get reelected. Uh, one of them has been in the New Hampshire legislature since 1976. For those keeping score, that's two years longer than I've been alive. No one should be an elected official for longer than anybody's been alive. Like even the little baby that was sitting in the front row here, like I, I don't know how old that baby is, but nobody should have been an elected official. A month. Yeah. Uh, I, I often get asked the question, who's my favorite president? And I answer with William Henry Harrison. Not because of anything he did before he got elected, but because as president, he did two things. He gave an inauguration speech, and he died of pneumonia. He signed no laws. He made no treaties, he declared no wars, he sent troops nowhere. He did two things. And I, I've been asked the troll question, well, if he elected, would you follow in his footsteps? And <laughs> of course I refuse to answer that question. But again, people that want to have power should not have power. And I've been asked the question numerous times, why are you running for president? Like, you know, you, you say that you don't want the U.S. government to exist. You say you don't want taxes. You say you don't want this. You don't want that. Why are you running? And the answer that I give is because, unfortunately, people pay attention to elections. And when you run as a candidate for a higher level office, people will have you on their radio shows. People will interview you for newspapers, for magazines, for television shows. And people will listen to you. And I've been doing a podcast for a couple years now. And I've had more people listen to me in the last month and a half 
being on a couple of different nationally syndicated radio shows and being interviewed for various podcasts than ever would have listened to me if the host did not say, Darrell Perry is a candidate for President of the United States. People will listen. And then when people listen, you get to advocate liberty. And who, who said it earlier? Uh, Michael, I think it was you that said, you can't unhear what you've heard. And that's exactly it. So when you've got conservatives listening to talk radio and they hear some crazy guy saying that the US government should not exist, that the Federal Elections Commission should be abolished, that all peaceful uh, criminals, and I, I hate using the term criminal, but I'll explain that later. Somebody during the Q&A asked me why I hate the term criminal, but I use it anyway. Uh, that all peaceful criminals that had no victim should be released from jail. And I don't know how well it's showing up, uh, but I've got a Silk Road pen on my jacket. And one of the first people that would get a presidential pardon from President Daryl Perry is Ross Albright. The second person to get a presidential pardon would Ross Albright. He, he was convicted of running the online black market Silk Road. Uh, they, they, yeah, they accused him of a murder for hire plot and it's since come out since his trial and his defense attorney was not allowed to mention this during trial because of the corrupt federal justice system that a DEA agent and a secret service agent not only uh, stole money from him and tried to extort him, but they were the ones that set up the murder for hire plot and convinced him to do it. So he's got these unfiled charges hanging in Maryland court of murder for hire that he never did. They've never charged him. He's never faced trial, and he probably never will. But the defense attorney was not allowed to mention that during this trial. The defense attorney was also not allowed to mention that Ross Ulbricht is a libertarian and that Ross Ulbricht thinks that the drug war should be abolished. So Ross Ulbricht on May 29th will face sentencing where he faces a minimum of 30 years in prison. The maximum sentence is, I think, five life sentences. All for making the black market safer. And the reason and the way that the black market was made safer is there were, and this is something that libertarians often advocate, he implemented, there were review systems to where if a seller said, I'm selling you, you know, fill in the blank drug, and what you received in the mail was not fill in the blank drug, you can put a review. This guy sold me crap. He said he was going to give me, you know, 100%, he gave me 50, whatever. And then people know, don't buy from that guy. Other people would earn the reputation of, he gives you a little bit more. You know, he'll tell you he's given you an ounce and he gives you, you know, like 1.1, whatever. So people would get reputations and rating systems. And the buyer or the sellers also got to rate the buyers. And that's something eBay used to allow and they've done away with to where if somebody, you know, made trouble for a seller on the Silk Road, the seller could say, this guy's trouble, stay away from him. And that's one way it made it safer because you knew what you were getting. It also made it safer because you were no longer going to the shady part of town with who knows who standing around the corner thinking that you might be somebody from a rival gang because you got on the wrong color t-shirt. So they, there have actually been studies that have been done that show that Bitcoin and the online marketplaces have made the drug war safer. They made the black market safer. So Ross Ulbricht would be person number one. Private Manning would be person number two. Edward Snowden would be person number three. And then a blanket pardon for every other person in jail or facing a federal charge for simple possession, selling, wiretapping, leaking, whistleblowing, any sort of thing that has no actual victim, they would all get a blanket pardon. Are the federal politicians. 
<laughs> because they're the real pros. So let, let me real quick get back to, uh, I, I briefly mentioned the legislative action and some of the things that are happening in New Hampshire. In Michigan, do you have 45 people that would be volunteers that would have at least one free day per week for about seven or eight months out of the year? Because that's how many you would need to have one person be a shadow legislator for each House committee and Senate committee. There are 24 House committees in Michigan and 21 Senate committees in Michigan. So if you had, even if you had 24 people and you could cover one house of the legislature, then you would be able to, anything bad that came out of the Senate, you would be able to testify against in the House. And it's something, I think that people need to do this a little more often, and it's something that I wish I would have been told about years ago, about how easy it is to testify to legislators. And I, I had never been told that you know, it's easy to find the House calendar. I was just, oh, well, you gotta go find it. Where is it? It's somewhere. No, so I, I was able to find house.michigan.gov is the website for the Michigan State House. You can go there, there's drop down menus, committees, hearings, uh, legislative proposals. It's super easy to find this information. And I, I realize that not everybody has the time to go to the legislative committees. And that brings up the final thing that people can do, and it's something that I think is underutilized by libertarians. And before I say what it is, how many people still read these outdated dinosaur things called newspapers? Okay, so one, two, like nine, maybe 10 of them. So people, people still read these occasionally. Letters to the editor. I, I cannot stress how important that is, especially when there's a legislative uh, action to be taken, like voting on Prop 1. If there's, I, I don't know what your school board makeup is, if you actually get to vote on school board budgets or not, but if you ever do, then you know, election times are really good times to write letters to the editor explaining not only why people should vote against something, but all the reasons that that thing should not exist in the first place. So in New Hampshire, I am going to revert back because we, we have this weird process for the school board in the city of Keene, where I live, where we have a deliberative session and then, and then the official balloting. And the deliberative session and official balloting is a modification of town meeting, which I understand is like a specifically New England sort of thing, to where basically this convention has been town meeting, to where everybody that is a concerned member comes, and the people that show up get to make the decisions for how things are going to proceed for the next year. So deliberative session, it adds an extra level to where people show up and say, this is what's going to be on the ballot in a month and a half. And you can influence that. And we, we always have a default budget and then the proposed budget. And this year, for the first time in many years, the default budget was less than the proposed budget. So voting no on the budget actually made a difference. Generally, it's you want to increase the budget by 2% or 4. It makes no real difference if you vote yes or no because the budget's going to increase anyway. This year, voting no on increasing the budget by 2% actually meant a decrease by about half a percent. And there were libertarians that wrote letters to the editor saying we should vote no on this. There, there were libertarians that petitioned to get warrant articles on the ballot. That, that's basically a ballot initiative sort of thing. Uh, and of course, those got modified during the deliberative session. But we got to explain, like, this is why the school board should not have this authority. This is why the governing body should not have the authority to do this. You are stealing money from us. You have parents that aren't using your school, but you're forcing them to pay for your school that is failing. 
Uh, Keene has some of the worst schools in the state of New Hampshire, and they spend on average about $3,000 per student more than the state average. There was a proposal to reduce the spending per student by $500 per year until it reached state average or for at least five years. And one of the objections to spending what the state average is, is, and I quote, we don't want our students to be average. Think about that for a second. You're spending more and getting less. Average would be an improvement. <laughs> so ju just to recap, things you can do to spread liberty is as loudly as possible and as often as possible, stand on your principles. That can be running as a candidate, going, speaking to legislative committees, speaking to legislators outside of committee, forming some sort of alliance to rate the legislators on how awful they are. And from what I've heard, it sounds as though pretty much everybody in the Michigan legislature would wind up getting like a C or below. And like the guy that gets a C is probably going to be the best you have. But that's one way that you can promote the ideas of liberty is to show people how horrible these guys are. And last but certainly not least, letters to the editor. It's something that is definitely underutilized. It seems that libertarians now want to do podcasts, and I've got like three of them, so I'm not trying to diminish podcasts at all. But you know, at some point, you wind up getting podcast overload, and, they're, you know, friends of mine that have podcasts, and they ask me, hey, do you listen to my podcast? I'm like, no, do you listen to mine? No. All right, so, like, we're even. But, uh, yeah, it, it's a what? Like, I'm not listening to theirs, they're not listening to mine, but somebody's listening to mine, because I, I get emails. I, I actually got an email, and this is just sort of a cute story that I wanted to share for no real reason. Uh, somebody sent me an email, she just had puppies, like her dog had puppies, like she didn't give birth to puppies. Uh, but she likes my podcast so much, she's naming the puppies Peace, Love, and Liberty. So, you know, like that, that's just a cute story. It's somebody's listening out there. But letters to the editor, I don't do letters to the editor as much as I should, but that's because I published my old newspaper. And, you know, suddenly so, like, there's four pages of nothing but Daryl's thoughts and opinions that gets spread across New Hampshire. But I, I should certainly do, I, I should take my own advice, is basically what I'm saying here. Uh, and with that, I will close and open the floor to uh, questions. And instead of calling it questions and answers, I'll call it Ask Me Anything. Oh, somebody asked me, that I had thrown out earlier to make sure that somebody asked me the question uh, about crime, criminal. I uh, that question. Wow. Yeah, Th thank you, James, for the question. Uh, so I, the reason that I hate the word crime, and I think that a lot of libertarians misuse it, is there's the very nifty catchphrase, no victim, no crime. And that is not a historically accurate use of the word crime. The word crime derives from Anglo-Saxon, an offense against the king. And while we no longer have a king, and it has been sort of changed to an offense against society. So when you say no victim, no crime, it's a nice sound bite, but it's not any, in any way historically accurate. So crimes aren't things that actually have victims. Things that have victims would properly be called torts. That, that's Tort with a T, T-O-R-T. How do you spell Ross's last name? Ulbricht, U-L-B-R-I-C-H-T. U-L-B-R-I-C-H-T. And you can find more about Ross at freeross.org.